family, my name is Vishuddha Das and I assist people with self-improvement and spiritual growth. And today I wanted to talk to you briefly and answer all the questions you asked me on Instagram about how to travel full time and how to live out of a backpack, out of an RV like I do right now. All those kind of questions, we're going to spend some time now answering as many of them as I can until sometime time in the future I get to the point where I make an entire in-depth video um, from what I think needs to be expressed the most. But a lot of that does exist here in these questions as well. So that being said, let's begin. Okay, so one of the biggest ones, of course, where do you park when it's time to sleep? So there's three ways you can do parking. You can do what I'm doing right now, which is just street parking, finding somewhere where you're allowed to park during the day on a street and where they let you park at night as well. So there's street parking, there are campgrounds, but that's only really if you have what I would say is, you know, a decent amount of money because you have to pay every single night for most campgrounds across the U.S. unless you're staying at a, a state park or national park campground, which is then anywhere from, you know, 30 to $5 a night, depending on the spot. But currently that's all closed. So once everything lets up from the virus, uh, you can either stay at a normal campground around the world or around the U.S. or a state or a national or state park campground for cheaper too. That's option two, campgrounds. And the third option is what's known as BLM land or dispersed camping. This means that there is land all over the US. It's so, so much land, especially on the West Coast, called BLM land or the Bureau of Land Management. Basically land that the United States government owns and allows its citizens to utilize at their leisure except for you know a few certain rules and pretty much every area that has dispersed camping or that has uh that is blm land which is used for dispersed camping which means just random people setting up shop wherever they want to be on that land you can stay anywhere up to 14 days at a time and in a lot of places park rangers don't even really uh care about this so you could even stay longer you could leave for a day and then come back and stay another 14 days it's easy to get around this and a lot of people kind of just stay out here in this blm land full time because well it's free so compared to even staying in you know national or state park campgrounds where it can be expensive or staying on a street like i am now which some people might be a little scared of or freaked out by you can stay on this blm land or on dispersed camping land from any city state or area around if you google it you'll find it for absolutely free and that's what i do okay so the second question is what do i do about sewage and showers so if your rv or van has a bathroom then you have a black water tank um or a gray water tank uh then you can just dump your water at any campground you go to or dump site you can find again on google maps or on apps like i overlander so what i usually do with things like sewage is since I do have a toilet, once the sewage fills up, I contact or I just call whatever KOA or campgrounds in the area and ask them if I can dump there. And they'll usually let you dump for free or for, you know, five or ten dollars. Um, and dumps don't happen very often. If you don't have a bathroom in your RV, that's where it comes down to you being more of a commando, right? You running off into nature, taking care of things, you know, digging a pit, using the bathroom, filling it back in, coming back to your RV, and then moving on. A lot of people don't have bathrooms, so it comes down to, again, public restrooms, or rest areas, or simply going out in nature. But that's, you know, if you don't have a restroom in your uh, travel vehicle, which some people don't, that's just how you gotta deal with it. Uh, for things like uh, water, basically how do I get water, how do I fill up with water, uh, how do I take showers and stuff, I have a shower in my RV. So I shower in here and I fill my clean water tank up. It's got about 11 gallons and I use that for showering, for my sinks, for washing dishes and so forth. Uh, if you don't have a shower, the best thing you can do is try to find a national gym chain. And if there is a good national gym chain, I'm not sure of which ones there are or aren't, but you can join them for say 30 bucks a month or whatever. And then you have access to all their locations around the US, which means if you are in a van and you drive from San Francisco to LA, you can still go into that gym in LA, take a shower, relax, get clean and so forth. So lots of van dwellers who don't have showers will do that. They will get a membership and shower other places or you can buy what's called a portable shower and then wash yourself with that. Uh, as for filling up water, if you ever wanna fill up water, uh, you simply, again, use apps like iOverlander or to look for um, spigots, like free water spigots. 
You can also go behind big shopping complexes. They often have free water spigots there too. Or again, like always, you can go to a campground and ask them if you can fill up on water and they'll usually charge you anywhere from five to $10, if not no money at all. So the past few campgrounds I've been to, they let me fill up for five bucks and 12 gallons of water, 11 gallons of water, plus my other water uh, container for five bucks is about as cheap as you're gonna get. And it works flawlessly. Okay, so in terms of how much does it cost, a lot of this comes down to your preference, right? Do you want to spend a lot and take out a big loan on a Sprinter and build it out and spend fifty dollars to $100,000? Or do you want to get a used uh, model RV from the 70s or 80s like I'm doing right now? I'm in an RV from the 80s that only costs me, you know, about five to 10 grand um, depending on what work needs to be done. That's all it really costs. And then once you buy it, it's just about taking care of it and accepting that sometimes you'll have to work on the engine or fix a little thing. The same way that little things come up in our daily life at all, that's just how it goes with RVs too. Once you buy it though, you're pretty much good to go. You don't have to really make any payments. You don't have to pay rent and it pays for itself back really fast. And so that's why I always recommend people go with simply investing fully in buying the RV and working on it rather than getting a loan for a very expensive vehicle and building the RV in that. Uh, besides that, the only money you spend is gas and food and how much you spend on that depends on again, how much you eat and how much you decide to drive to different places. So those numbers vary. The question is why do it, right? What do I gain from van life? Well, you gain freedom. That's the biggest thing, right? If you have an apartment or a house, no matter how nice it is, no matter how beautiful it is, you're kind of stuck there. You're stuck in that place. You can visit other places. You can go places for short amounts of time, but that can get really expensive really fast. Having an RV, like I said, getting a cheap one, it pays for itself very quickly. And then from that point on, you are absolutely free to go wherever you want in the country or even, you know, to Mexico or Canada. So you have lots of options of where you can travel with your RV, but that's the biggest thing. And that's the reason most people do it is that it's easy to contain everything into one spot, which helps you to save up money because you're not buying random things 24 seven and filling up houses or apartments. Uh, and on top of that, you can then travel freely to wherever you feel like going as often as you'd like or as often as work permits. How to prepare financially. The only big thing I would say is that if you're buying an RV, make sure you have at least, at least, I would say two to three grand that you can spend on top of it if something goes wrong. That's the one thing you do have to realize is that it takes care. You have to take care of it because it's a vehicle too. There's an engine, you have to deal with that. It's a car and a house. So things can go wrong your engine could have an issue, the exhaust could have an issue, the electrical could have an issue, something could change, could blow a tire, whatever it might be. These things can often be very cheap to fix, but they can also in poor circumstances become very expensive. And if you don't have, if you spend say 10 grand on an RV and you only had $11,000 in your savings account, well, what happens if something goes on in the engine and it costs 1200 to fix? Well, now you're kind of stuck. You don't want to be in that position. So save up a few grand at least. I say two to three minimum, but me personally, I always have in my spending for dealing with an RV, not dealing with, but in case I always have a good three to four grand, I know I can access or dip into if anything goes wrong. And thankfully nothing major has gone wrong. The only thing I've ever paid for in the engine wise is to uh, replace the clutch because the clutch was very old and it was sticky. Um, but that was a personal choice. I didn't have to do it, but I decided to. And that's a good thing for you too. If you have money saved to deal with the issues that might arise from living in a vehicle slash home, uh, it makes it a less stressful thing. So save up some money before you do that on top of what you pay for the RV. Ooh, okay, so vehicle recommendations. So as for recommendations for van life, again, it's a very personal thing. Do you want a big RV, like a school bus size that's 40 feet? Do you want a smaller one like mine that's about 22 feet and has a full basic mini house in it? Do you want a something closer like a cargo van, which is even smaller or a Sprinter, which is smaller and more condensed? Or do you want us to do something like a Ford Transit, which is super, super compact and small uh, to travel in? It all depends, right? Which kind of RV or van you should go for depends on what you feel you want and need. And for me, it was like, I want a place where I can have separate room, not just to sleep and work, but also to relax and then to 
take care of the primary functions of life, which is washing dishes and stuff, having room to cook, having room to shower, and having a bathroom especially. So all that I found in a package of the 1980s uh, C-Class Toyotas. They're my favorite RVs. So if I ever get another one, it'll just be another one of these, a C-Class uh, V6 Toyota RV. This one's called an Odyssey. Um, there's many models, Dolphin, Leisure, so forth. They're all great. But it all comes down to, again, what you feel you need for van life or for traveling full time. So how to generate an income and live nomadically. This is the big make or break for a lot of people. Um, if you are stuck in one location, you can do van life in that city and then take all the free time you have outside of it to go explore in that area. But for most people who do live in RVs and stuff, it's because they can make a living online or travel and make a living, right? Do different trade jobs around the country or work online. So there's, everyone asks me this question 24 seven, right? How do I make a living online? How do I make a living traveling? It comes down to the mere fact that it's different for everyone. I can't tell you how to build a successful business or how to gain 100,000 followers because everybody has a different path and everybody has different practices. And me saying this is how might not work for you. It might be the opposite advice of what you need, but it comes down to, and if you want to really know how to make money and travel and make a living outside of the nine to five being caught somewhere, I have another video from a few weeks ago that can break that down better than I can at all in this short video. Uh, so go watch that down below. The link will be right here and it'll be mentioned up here too. And that can help you get a feel for what needs to be done to become financially independent uh, and travel especially. So if you want to travel alone, but it scares you, that's a big thing is, you know, you have to get over that fear. It's always going to be a little bit scary being in an RV or a van by yourself in unfamiliar places, but you just kind of have to accept that. Sometimes you're parked on the side of the road and it's pitch black and there's no one around. And if that scares you, maybe van life's not for you. For me, it's like, well, I'm, you know, I gotta live life. But if that's not something you ever wanna think about is even a possibility, because it is, uh, again, van life might not be for you. It's for thrill seekers and risk takers on many levels and people who want to escape the normal. And if normal to you has to be always feeling safe 24 seven wherever you go, you will not like van life because you will not feel safe all the time. Places you will have to stay won't always be safe and there will be bumps and creaks and groans and noises outside your RV at night sometimes and you have to accept that and just continue trying to sleep or trying to work, whatever it might be. If you're sitting there in the dead of night worrying about every little thing that happens, you're never going to like it, but that's how it is. It happens to everybody all over the place. Everyone has horror stories. Uh, it's just part of you know, the, the risk you are deciding. When you're alone in a house, in a specific spot or an apartment, you don't have to worry about that. But when you're on a street, anyone can approach you. When you're in a park or in a city, anyone can approach you. Uh, the chances of that are absolutely minimal, but still, if that's something that's going to continuously worry you, van life might not be for you. You have to be totally okay with the chaotic nature of living on the road and how things can be very fun, but also at times very sketchy. Okay, so what are the most essential things you need to live on the road? The biggest thing is solar power. I think solar power is the most important because if you're gonna be working online or even traveling, you wanna be able to always charge your phones, laptops, whatever it might be. Uh, especially to use the electrical outlets in your RV or van um, to power things too. Solar is very important. I rarely ever see other van dwellers or RV lifers who do not have at least 100 to 500 watts of solar on the roof. It's just a commonality. I have 400 watts of solar and a 200 uh, milliamp hour battery, which is tons of power, plenty for me as a singular person, but that's the most important, solar power. Second thing is being able to cook. So a fridge or um, a stove top. So right here I have a butane stove top or a, a, a propane stove top so I can cook whenever I need to and I have a fridge too to hold all my food. So that's important too. Even if you're in a van, you have to have somewhere to store your food, a uh, fridge, and then a stove top to cook on. There's so many little things that are pivotally important, but a good thing too for in the cold and at night is a heater, like a catalytic heater, a small catalytic heater by say uh, Olympian, which is what I have. It's called the Wave 8. A heater is, ah, oh God, I can't even explain how important a heater is. You might be like, oh, it's no big deal. Um, it won't get too cold. It gets ice cold at night, no matter where you go. Cold seeps in. When you're sitting in a metal box 
for hours at a time at night, the cold gets in no matter how much insulation you have. It just makes its way in slowly. So a way to circumvent that and not to have to worry about freezing your butt off literally all the time is to have a heater. And that makes life so much better. You'll be blown away by how good it feels too to be on the road and have it be say 50 degrees outside. Um, sorry Europeans, I don't know Celsius, but to have it be 50 degrees outside and then you come inside and it's 75 and nice and and toasty it's it's a beautiful thing so get a heater those are what i would say the top three are solar uh cooking in a fridge and stuff to hold your food and make it and then a heater how do you manage to find water in isolated regions anything this is a big thing before you go into isolated places stock up you have to stock up fill up on gas get an extra five gallon gas canister i even have an extra two gallon gas canister for my motorcycle on the back of my rv um i always make sure before i go into rural areas that i'm again full gas my water's all the way full my sewage is totally dumped uh, my solar's charged up if it's been sunny i make sure i have everything i could possibly need to survive as long as i would need to if say the worst possible happened right if the worst happened i would still have 11 gallons of water and I would have all my food and I would have all my gas uh, so it's a lot less sketchy you don't just want to go into rural areas without preparation so that's really all it takes is just before you go into rural areas asking yourself do I have everything I need full to the max ready to go and if so you're good and if not stock up Okay, the best travel apps. This is a good one. So my favorite app is iOverlander. iOverlander is the best overall app for finding the things you need in different places to camp and fill up on propane or water, whatever it might be. iOverlander is great. Uh, free Roam is good. Freecampsites.net is also good. And then just Google Maps. Google Maps works very good too with you know showing you different areas. Whenever I'm looking for BLM land or dispersed camping, if I'm not using iOverlander, I almost always just go to Google Maps first because the places pop up but those are the main ones okay and so the final one is that what about hurdles and difficulties during van life and that's that's traveling and living nomadically is the same as picking up or doing anything new right it doesn't matter if you're living nomadically or picking up a new sport or a new hobby there will always be a learning curve you know I can't sit here and say these problems will definitely happen here's all the solutions little things happen all the time every single day and that's how you kind of start to learn about the space you live in find and innovate your own solutions and then deal with it and keep moving on uh, there's little tweaks and twists and little splashes all over this thing of little things i did to kind of make it better or to make less things fall down or more stuff be where it needs to be or more accessible it's just it's a very creative process and problems do arise and it might be difficult at first but the more you do it as the days go by you get more familiar with the process and more comfortable with it you forget less you remember more and you start embracing the experience rather than worrying about what might go wrong so those are the core uh questions you guys asked me over on instagram i hope they can help you with nomadic living um i'll be doing a full comprehensive guide one of these days i might do it as like a pdf or ebook i don't know if i'll do it as a video but regardless i hope this helped you guys out i hope you enjoyed it and if so remember to subscribe below and leave any comments so i can continue helping uh helping you once this video is out <laughs> ram ram